Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you so much for making time to join us. My name is Andy Boone. I am a member of MCOE's Health Safety and Support Team. You may see here the acronym HSS, Health Safety and Support. Uh, I'm excited to be here today. Prior to joining the HSS team, I uh, part of my professional background includes working as a site admin in the Novato District, as well as Larkspur and Corte Madera Schools. And in both of those districts, I've been deeply involved in health and safety work and really excited to be a part of the HSS crew here at the MCOE. I would like to formally welcome you to the second Marin County Crisis Response Suicide Prevention and Postvention Protocol Training. So our hope is you're intending to be a part of that training. Again, second, Marin County Crisis Response. It's a mouthful. Suicide Prevention and Postvention Protocol Training. Thank you so much for joining us. And we're going to jump right into it today. I first want to remind you that the training is being recorded. And we will have this training available on our HSS resources page. Um, today's training is a follow-up of the May 2022 training. And really intended for those people who are unable to make that training or you just want to join us today for the latest and greatest. Um, that training I'll mention was hosted by our now Deputy Superintendent John Lenz um, and our Ed Services Coordinator Michelle Drake. And very soon I will drop a link into the chat that will link you to that training as well as connect you to some resources that we um, house on our HSS resources page. Um, I will mention that the HSS uh, support team is growing and um, I wanna pause today and um, share that I have the pleasure of co-presenting with my partner in this work. Technically, she is my boss. Um, now's a great time to introduce Dr. Lisa Miller. And she's going to take us through the agenda and, and so much more today. So welcome, Lisa. Um, thanks, Andy. Hi, everybody. I'm really happy to be here with you. Uh, my name is Lisa Miller, and I am Director of Health, Safety, and Support. I joined MCOE this summer and um, really passionate about the work we're about to cover over the next hour, along with all things student wellness. My background is I started as a school psychologist and over the last several years have been in leadership roles of uh, for student safety um, and wellness. And that did unfortunately include responding to school-based crises. Um, so, you know, this work is um, unfortunately familiar to me yet also something that um, I just have a lot of passion about in terms of being able to serve our community and our youth. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here. We're so happy you were able to carve out time in what I know is a very busy schedule. Um, so we, we promise to honor your time and we will end by 4.30. Um, I do want to acknowledge that this topic, um, you know, crisis response and suicide prevention it may be activating uh, for one of you or some of you, and you may have a personal experience or family experience, a colleague experience that may make this conversation and topic um, you know, more difficult for you. And we wanna recognize that and completely open to if you need to step back or um, you know, step aside from participation, we recognize that and completely support that, whatever decision you need to make for your own wellness. And if any of you wanna meet with us individually at a different time, we would welcome that. So just wanna make sure your time in the next hour feels right for you. Um, and again, we're looking forward to your participation. If at any time through this, you have a question, we want this to be interactive. Don't hesitate. Um, you can either put it in the chat or raise your hand and we will call on you. So that's a little bit about setting up um, why we're here or what brings us today. I do wanna briefly go over our agenda. There's four main things. First is we're gonna talk about the background and the purpose of this uh, postvention protocol. 
We're gonna take a look inside the actual set of protocols. And then we're gonna have a scenario that will allow us to work through the different elements and through the actual flow chart so that you feel a little bit more familiar with the protocol. And then at the end, um, should there be time, we would love to report out and share and certainly answer any questions. So background, what brought us to creating a Marin County crisis response set of protocols? Um, well, this, you know, unfortunately um, is the result of some countywide tragedies that happened in 2017. At that time, there was um, some contagion with youth suicide. Specifically, there were five students that died by suicide in 2017. Um, from that, a lot of um, individuals and community members and many of you as professionals wanted to come together and try to basically organize an approach that better prepares sites, districts, and all of us as educators to prevent um, contagion from happening again or any youth suicide, but also to be prepared should there be um, a death by suicide and what is the level of postvention and intervention. So be, um, the Marin County Behavioral Health, Public Health, Law Enforcement, Kaiser, and many of you school administrators, many uh, wellness providers and mental health clinicians came together to create um, what really is this incredible resource that will guide all of us through suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. Um, beyond that, another reason for this is many districts and or school sites were working in silos um, and doing the best they could to get through this type of tragedy. And another thing that was learned is it would really benefit all of us as an overall community if we had common language and common vocabulary. Um, because when a crisis is happening in one district, all the districts within Marin County jump in and want to offer support and work shoulder to shoulder. And if we're using a common approach, common language, and common vocabulary, it makes it a lot easier to do that jumping in with one another. And so we're more of a collective team um, as opposed to still continuing to work in those silos. So that's another big part of why this overall protocol exists. It gives us also the tools, really the most important tools to guide all of us should a suicide tragedy occur in our county. And of course, our goal is to prevent that. Um, but if one does happen, we feel this comprehensive resource will really equip everybody to go through the procedures and the steps that allow a community to get through that crisis. Okay, great. So at this point, what I'm gonna do is The soft copy of the document and the most current version of it is available on our website. And just a heads up that uh, your crisis response team leads have all received hard copies of the document. And it looks, resolution is probably not great, but hard copy is a book that looks like this. And I'm going to show you now how to navigate to it. The link to the document was in the response and Zoom registration that we sent you. But if you don't have it up, it is a tool that we're going to use today. And so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And in the chat, I'm going to drop the link. So if you don't have the document up, you'll want to visit here. And I'll pause, as I'm sure some of you will be navigating via web browser to that document. And while I stop sharing, I'm going to toggle over to that page and share my screen again. And this is where we keep our crisis response protocols. So you now have that 
link. This is what the page looks like. Encourage you to, to go ahead and uh, bookmark that page. Here, this top link is uh, the training from May. I mentioned that John Lenz and Michelle Drake led. So if you want to review that May training, you're more than welcome. Um, here is a link to the uh, version 3.6. That's the most current version of the crisis response document and, and the tool that we'll use today during our time together. Um, we'll go over in detail this valuable document here, which is now Appendix W. It's the crisis response flowchart. It's in the materials um, that you have the link to. And, and really the feedback so far, which we'll get into later, has been this is a super valuable document in the event that you'll need to re, uh, respond to crisis. And then lastly, all the appendices, which again, we'll touch on later, but the most current version of our appendix is here, organized by subject matter. And these are the tools that you would access if you needed to communicate with students and families along the way. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen again, go back to the presentation. Here we are. I'm gonna share a screen one more time. All right, so let's dive into the document. Can everybody see that okay? A quick look inside. Wonderful. So the document is organized in um, some basic sections, if you will. The, there's an introduction section, then three sections that cover prevention, intervention, and postvention strategies. We're going to spend the bulk of today really focused on the postvention work. There's also a section that highlights and uh, offers resources around the long-term response to a death by suicide. And as I mentioned earlier, um, the appendix with all those valuable resources. Uh, the introduction is just what you might think. I think a couple pieces that I would highlight, it really provides the why, the why uh, we felt we feel like it's important uh, initially to do this work and now collectively highlighting why we're coming back together to practice. Um, it also provides necessary operational definitions. So as Lisa noted, a common language is something that we're striving for uh, to all come together and do this work. And so those key operational definitions are highlighted immediately up front in the, in the intro. So that's definitely a section that you'll want to review. Um, we spend some time in the document covering prevention and, and the core components. Think about prevention as most of you on this call, I'm sure know as the upstream upstream work. These are the policies required at the district level, um, the training and education for your school staff. Um, one example is Cognito. It's a software tool, a, a resource that's made available to all districts uh, across all districts and all sites in Marin County. Intervention um, is the third section of the document. And, and, and the bulk of intervention, intervention really we're talking about forming the crisis response team. So sort of that foundational unit that would re respond in the time of crisis. And you know, intervention work is really about understanding roles and responsibilities of those people in involved uh, and a part of the CRT and really meeting, practicing, and understanding the functions that those groups will serve when responding to a crisis. So, um, that's intervention. And then, as I mentioned earlier, postvention, and you can tell by the number of pages there, is really the bulk of the document. Postvention activities are broken down into um, linear steps, easy to follow linear steps. And as I mentioned, this is really the focus of the time that we're going to spend together today. Um, postvention work is prescribed and, and a thought to keep in mind, it's prescribed and designed with the intent to return the school environment to a normal routine as soon as possible, while also offering human supports to people. And in this way, postvention work really serves as preventative work. And we'll get more into why that's so here in a bit. Um, I also mentioned that the long-term long response is an important part of the document that starts on page 44. It's um, 
not really shown there in my slide, but long-term long response, page 44. And again, uh, like the other sections, this is broken down into um, linear important steps to follow. And the idea here is that this work is not done in a single day, or I guess the point to make here is the long-term response work is not done in a single day, but this is ongoing. And it's the long-term response support is done as long as it's required to support those people impacted. And then finally, the appendices section, we hear time and time again, this is a super uh, uh, important part, a helpful part, because these are tools in your hands. Uh, also something to point out for the appendices, these are helpful documents and that can be applied to crisis in an accidental death. So it doesn't, not just a death by suicide, but examples um, include sample letters to parents, talking points for the community and families, uh, resources that you can share with families in the community and, and so much more. So that's a, a quick dive into what's included in the manual. And something that um, I think Lisa is going to talk through is a really important document, one that we refer to as the roadmap or is actually titled the crisis response flowchart. Yeah, and if you could, Andy, if you could just go back to the slide you just were speaking to, I just want to share with everybody on here, our time today is about this postvention response and as that turns into prevention. Um, so um, on some level, it's it, a crisis has occurred and we're entering at that point with you today in terms of going through this protocol. What I want to highlight to you is, is all of you, I believe, received an email from me, if not once, maybe twice, um, inviting all of our mental health providers at all of our schools to participate in a suicide risk assessment and intervention training. Um, that's also happening. So I, I don't want you to think um, as an overall county, we're focused only on the postvention side of this really important work. We also have a really um, robust and I think intensive and very comprehensive training occurring on that prevention side and that intervention side. Um, so if you have any questions about that particular training, feel free to email me or um, put something in the chat and I'll follow up with you. So for the rest of our time today, we're gonna to be looking at, unfortunately, if a crisis happens, what do we do? So as Andy indicated, this flow chart um, really is, um, you know, a great way to visualize how you work through all those linear steps that get you through responding to a, a suicide crisis that's taken place in your community. Um, and as Andy just put in the chat, it is Appendix W. So if you have the hard copy, you can locate it there online. It would be available um, in, the, in the appendices section. Um, I, we're going to use this a little bit later today. Overall, though, I would say this is the one you want tabbed in your manual. You're going to refer to it often. Um, and again, it just really breaks down the most essential steps and how one flows into the other. Um, because the font is so small here, we're going to go to the next slide, which now highlights what are those seven steps that were just represented on that flow chart. And what I want to orient you to before we go into each of these seven steps is the need for all of us when we are responding to a crisis to take time to be self-aware of how you're doing and how you're able to respond to the crisis. Um, for those of us that have gone through it, it can be really emotional. It can be very stressful. Um, it could be very rapid pace. Um, and those are all things that you can't always prepare for is your own um, response to a crisis. So as you're thinking about these steps, if you could keep in the back of your mind, how are you grounding yourself in this work and centering yourself so that you can be that member of the crisis response team? So if that means at times you need to nourish yourself, that you can nourish others, it's so important to take that time to do it um, and to acknowledge that 
any crisis is going to have an impact on you, even though you're part of the crisis response team. And that's really normal. So knowing that, that the awareness of yourself and how you're grounding and centering yourself, these are the steps that we um, have highlighted in the protocols that you would follow should a crisis occur. And the first one is verification, which seems you know, pretty clear. Um, this is just making certain that you have the facts about the circumstance and that a death has actually occurred, um, what those circumstances were about this, um, the suicide. So verification may seem um, easy at first, um, but having been through this, it is so important that the right people are in touch with those that have the facts. Um, not that you wouldn't have already done that, but as you'll experience if you haven't already, um, a lot of false narratives and rumors blow up um, before you may even get your hands on the facts. So verification is always your first step here. You cannot pursue any of the, the subsequent steps until you have verification. And on the flow chart, you know, that is, that is, um, you know, identifying somebody on your crisis response team who is pursuing that verification. It's important to not have a flurry of people from your community trying to reach out and seek that verification. So after verification, then the district crisis response team or personnel are alerted that a crisis has occurred and some of those facts are shared. Once the crisis response team has been notified and are engaged, then they're gonna to wanna to work with and communicate with the impacted family or families. And each person in the crisis response team will have designated roles. And that is something we encourage all of you to work through and think about prior to a crisis occurring. Um, and the manual gives you more information about that. Um, the more prepared you are in who's going to take on what roles, um, the easier some of this will be while you're in that heightened state of trauma or crisis. Um, you know, if you have people already identified who would be the primary point of contact with law enforcement, that makes it a lot easier to get your facts. If you know who's going to be your media relations, that's great. Maybe they've come up with some templates or reviewed the templates in the protocol. So role awareness um, in advance can be really helpful. Once you have your team kind of activated and everybody's brought together and you've been in communication with the family, because you want to know what the family wants you to do, uh, you have to obtain their permission to share anything that might be individual to the student or the family. Um, and many families don't want you to do that. Um, they don't want anything personally shared so that you have to verify that. Um, and once you do, then your team starts to work through, all right, how are we going to notify our community? What is going to be our notification? What communication channels are we going to use? Um, so you work through the planning of all of that as a team. Um, and you know each circumstance is different. The grade span of the child will influence this. Um, are there siblings in the district will influence this? There's so many factors you have to consider at step four um, before you move into, okay, what's our notification protocol? Once you work through step four, then you start moving through all the notifications of to the staff, to the students, and the broader community. And the resource manual has a lot of carefully worded templates to help you through that. So you're not starting at zero in that communication. Um, so again, encouraging you to look through that so that you're familiar with some of that verbiage, um, which actually would equip you if you find yourself having to engage verbally with people as well. Once notifications are sent out, um, step six is to develop media protocols. And we all know how, um, how quick the media gets involved um, and how much they're gonna wanna know. And having a specific media protocol is gonna be essential. You cannot avoid it. There's no way you can. So this is called out as a specific step in the overall um, protocol. And then lastly, 
the postvention planning and long-term responses, you know, this is making sure we're continuing to care for one another, that we're continuing to care for the impacted family and community, and that you're caring for yourself, and that we're doing some level of analysis for hopefully prevention in the future. So again, these are the, the, sal the seven salient steps. Um, each one obviously has a lot more qualitative information behind it, but to put it in its most simplistic form, these are the steps and they're mirrored on that flow chart. Again, we can't emphasize enough the importance of being self-aware and that you may be on the crisis response team, um, but your role in that you know, may need to shift a little bit because of the circumstances and how, you're, how you are managing it for yourself. Um, and again, you have to nourish yourself before you can nourish others. Thank you, Lisa. So uh, time check, we're at the halfway point, and now we're gonna transition into uh, how I'll, I'll, I'll frame this as our collective fire drill. We're gonna walk through a scenario together, and then we're going to use the steps that Lisa just covered, um, the seven essential steps, and figure out how we would respond. And we'll spend the last 25 or so minutes um, working um, down that path. So think fire drill. And here's really what we want you to walk away with. So if step one is verification, there are page numbers in the document that are tools for you to help, help you as Lisa uh, covered how to respond. And then there are sections in the appendix or a section in the appendix that puts um, those tools in your hands for how to communicate or resources that you can share with your teams and families. So at the end of the presentation, we'd like you to, to have all of this information filled out so that each of the essential steps, you'll know page numbers, where to go in the document, as well as tools from the appendix that you can use. Now, I probably shouldn't show you this, but in case you don't end up with all the necessary information, we have created a cheat sheet for you and we'll provide you with the information. This is something that's available on the website and we'll also send it to all participants in today's training. Some of you may be scribbling down some of the answers now knowing that that's a part of the exercise. Okay, so here's the scenario. You receive a call from law enforcement on Sunday night, and the call is regarding a youth in your district. You learn that the coroner has indicated that the youth has died by suicide at their home. Okay. What happens next? And so now we're going to transition into a team exploration. There are a number of ways that we can work with this material, and we want this to be some uh, time that we spend together that's interactive. And so we're going to dive right into it, first using our roadmap. And I'm going to turn it back to Lisa to help get us started. Yeah, so um, we, I went, briefly went over the steps, and based upon the scenario, um, you know, the first one we would obviously want to do would be verification. And I'm wondering from those of you that are participating, what does, what would that look like for you in your specific community? Who would it be? We would love to know from the practical part of this, how does verification work for you? And maybe that's something that we could ask them to to waterfall into the chat. So we'll try that. Um, um, on the count of three, sort of with verification in mind and how you would respond given the scenario. And let me back up just so folks can sort of sink into what that scenario is. It's Sunday night regarding the youth in the district. You learn, as I stated, the coroner has indicated that the youth has died by suicide. Verification is the first step. In the chat box, I'll count to three and feel free and share what you would do. How would you go about, who would you notify? How would you go about that verification process in three, two, one, go.
And if you don't know, it's okay to say, I don't know yet. What you all have put in there is great, yes. Um, verification is one, you know, obviously confirming that the death has occurred um, and that you would definitely need to be engaging with law enforcement. And one person on your team would be that point of contact with uh, your local law enforcement, um, whether that's your principal or your superintendent or somebody that's obviously been identified as that um, representative on behalf of the school community. Upon that verification, somebody on the crisis response team um, would need to call the family um, and engage directly with the family about the death. Again, um, offering the support and the condolences and communicating with the family about what they are or are not wanting to be communicated out to the broader community. Um, so everything you guys put in the chat is great. Contact law enforcement, contact your crisis response team, your superintendent, your principal. Um, we wanna get those individuals informed so that they can work through the verification steps. And as Andy is showing the answers to that part of verification, where you can find this information in the manual is page number 20. And again, it's that flowchart appendix W. So what we'd like to um, you know, ask you now, and again, you're welcome to use the chat feature, or if anybody would like to share um, you know, from your the seat that you sit in, is um, activating your crisis response team, either what that looks like for you if you have already identified the team, or potentially, um, you know, who are the members that are on your crisis response team? Obviously, you are since you're here today, um, but we'd like to know a little bit more about what that means to you at your local level. If you could put it in the chat or if anybody wants to share. All right, we will keep going. Um, so to activate um, your crisis response team, it's the same pages and the same appendix. Again, you know that's just working you through the flow chart. It's, it's a notice, um, preferably a phone call um, or in-person communication is ideal when you are activating your crisis response team. That is not always possible because we're on so many different sites and in so many different locations. Um, if you um, end up needing to use email, or something on your phone. Um, of course, you know, be judicious in the words that you use and the language you're using in that communication, just from the sense of it could be forwarded um, or it reaches an audience that you did not intend to reach. Um, so, you know, that may not be where you share everything to activate the crisis response team. It might be, hey, we need to get together. I need you here in 30 minutes from wherever you are, you know, whatnot. Just Again, be judicious about anything on email or, or on uh, your phone in terms of activating. Any questions about your crisis response team? No, okay. And just one point, one, one additional point. Um, page 77 in the document, page starting at page 76. Uh, Appendix L has several versions of 
uh, ways that you might organize your crisis response team, create a phone tree and a really simple place, a Google Doc um, as one example to where um, contact information for everyone on your crisis response team can be housed. And that's, that's the document that you would refer to in this scenario. That's Appendix L on page, starting on page 76. So the next step is working with and communicating with the family. Um, so we, you know, I think we've emphasized this before, the importance of ascertaining um, from the impacted family what they do and do not want shared. Um, we, we definitely would want to also, um, you know, communicate with somewhat of a broader, um, broader families or those that are most closely impacted to check in on them and see how they're doing and, and really start to use this information to inform us of what is going to be our notification out to the much broader community. Um, it's been my experience where families actually designate somebody to speak on their behalf or individuals to speak on their behalf. Um, so again, you, you may have a, a little bit of a wider group that you're needing to engage with at this step so that you are fulfilling the family's wishes in terms of communication and that the crisis response team is informing themselves of what is it that we can share and then how are we going to share that. So that is step three, is working directly with the family and communicating with family. So this is where um, it gets a little bit confusing for me on the, on the flow chart. So I'm just gonna clarify this. So step four is really where you as the crisis response team need to talk through and figure out, okay, what is what language are we using to communicate? What templates are we using? Or what is going to be our, the words that we're using? what is going to be the dissemination plan of this and how far and wide is that dissemination plan? So that's step four is actually the planning and the coming to agreement as a crisis response team of this is how we're going to do notification. That's step four. Step 5A, really, yeah, step 5A and 5B um, is taking those templates um, or you can write your own. You certainly don't need to only use our template, but it's the notification procedures at this point. You've ascertained the facts. You've communicated with the family, so you're not going to violate any of their wishes. You've identified as a crisis response team, what are each of our roles? How are we going to communicate? What language are we using? And how are we disseminating? And that is really what steps 5, 5A, and I think 5B are. Um, and that would include communicating with other students, with staff, with other parents, guardians, and then the broader community. Once you've done all of those le levels of communication, having a media protocol comes next. Um, you may, if you haven't already had this experience, you may um, find yourself buried quickly in a crisis by media inquiries. Um, depending on what the crisis is. And I encourage you to remember that addressing the media absolutely does not come before getting in front of and notifying your specific community. Um, the media can wait. They don't think they can wait, but they can wait. And being okay with that um, so that you're giving your crisis response team to think carefully and thoughtfully about how we're gonna notify is so important. So the media step comes after that. And again, that's okay. Um, you know, so making sure your campus or your district is clear, what are our protocols in terms of having media on campus? Where can they be located? Who's your primary point person? Um, you know, and making sure everybody across all the staff are aware of what those protocols are. Um, that again is something to have planned in advance um, because it's amazing what can happen to you in the moment of a tragedy or a crisis and you might not be so quick to remember those things 
So you want to have practiced that or at least know, all right, here's my media person and have that very clearly in front of you so that you don't miss that step when you're getting the inquiries. All right, and then step seven is that long-term um, you know, care for the community. It's reviewing the protocol overall that was used to navigate the crisis and the tragedy. It's um, really evaluating, was there something we might have been able to do to prevent this or um, provide an intervention? Is there a way we can strengthen our systems or enhance our systems or additional training? Is there more care that's needed for the students, the school site community, the staff? Um, and, you know, thinking also about the long term, um, you know, as the, an the annual anniversary comes up of the death by suicide, or, you know, something coming up for the family, potentially the, the birthday of that student, or if the student was a graduating senior and at graduation, there's a lot of life events that happen for students and not losing sight of those and the impact that could possibly have on your community. So thinking about those as part of that long-term plan, in addition to strengthening the prevention and intervention, and then improving any of the protocols that were used um, so hopefully, you know, should you have to go through this the next time, we don't make the same mistakes, um, which definitely this is a living document, by the way. It's if there's something we learn and this needs to be enhanced and improved upon, we do that. Um, you know, unfortunately, these these kinds of things evolve and we have to make adjustments. So that is step seven. I think we got through all the essential steps. Are there questions on those? Something that you've experienced that we didn't raise that you'd like us to think about? I'll share. Okay, great. <laughs> I had a situation just last year where the police had told me a student's father died, but it was actually his brother, which was a pretty big deal, right? Um, so always like double, double check, even when it's coming from an authoritarian source. That's my advice. Learn that lesson. Yeah, um, Marie, thanks. I'm glad you shared that. Um, I wish I could say that that never happens, but I think sometimes even law enforcement is working in such a flurry of incoming information that there might be a misunderstanding. There is no question verification is, the, is one of the most important steps here. And to really make sure you have the facts before you start communicating out or doing anything. And that may take time. And again, you might be seeing social media blowing up by students, they're hearing things. And so you're feeling a sense of urgency of I gotta get in front of this. Don't get in front of it until you have the facts and you have that full verification. That's I appreciate you sharing that learned lesson. Ms. Yeah, yeah. Ms. Malboza. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to follow up. Thank you, Marie, for your for your scenario. I also feel like we've been hearing, unfortunately, uh, like you said, through 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 family or community members, we'll hear about parents passing away that were through suicide. Do you, does your guidebook have any? Uh, and I haven't had. The, the time to look through it, which by the way, I'm excited. I think the guidebook is, <laughs> we need to put this in everybody's hands that does this type of work, but does the guidebook have any suggestions for handling uh, non-student information that is trickling into the community, into the school community? Andy, do you want to take that or do you want me to? Um, so, I think the guide, what we've heard back from the field is that the guidebook is an excellent resource for accidental deaths and suicide and some of the resources, many of the resources, I should say, in the appendices can be modified um, to use for your specific situation. So um, I hesitate to say uh, yes, but I do think it's a helpful resource and can be modified for the scenario which you described. Yeah, what I would add to that is, 
each campus or district might function differently in terms of how much they engage in communication regarding parent deaths or family deaths that are not with students um, that are attending school. Not suggesting it's ignored, uh, but there are there are different some level of a different approach around how much gets shared to a broader community um, if it's not a student. Um, so that is something for districts to consider. But again, I agree with Andy, the resources in here could really help you navigate that. Any other thoughts or questions at this point? All right. All right. So we have about 10 minutes left together. Um, I'll open it up one more time. Thoughts or comments? I know your time is valuable, so it wouldn't be the um, a bad thing to let you go early, but do want to make sure if this is an opportunity, but you don't want to raise your hand live to drop something in the chat or to raise a hand and offer a comment or question. Going once. All right. So this is the point. Melina. Where Andy, we have Melina. Oh, okay. Thank you, Melina. I snuck right in there. Thank you. Um, you know, I was actually typing something into the chat when Lisa mentioned like social media. Um, and I know that, you know, you never want to say anything until you have those facts and you have like that prepared statement that you want to, you know, put out there. Um, it, are there any other tactics? Because as we all know, social media can get completely and totally out of control, especially in small communities. Are there any like steps that, that you can take to help kind of combat that as far as, you know, like the school Facebook saying, you know, you know, we will get you information as soon as you can, or do you just ignore that? So um, that's, it's such a good question, um, Melina, and it's one you, you will reckon with. You, this is a reality that happens with school-based um, crises, for sure. Um, there, this sounds awful, but there really is somewhat of a balance to be struck between responding and addressing false narratives that are starting to generate a lot of attention and movement versus you can't respond to everything. And if you find yourself responding to everything, then you're not going to have the time to work on what you need to be working on, which is you know all the elements in the protocol and caring for your community. Um, so having one designated media relations person is one of the most important points. And having that person be informed by the crisis response team of if, if a social media or a false narrative gets out there that is starting to damage or become really hurtful, then there's quick statements you could put out as a district or a school site that says, you know, this is not a fact-based statement. Facts will be forthcoming. Please look only to district-issued communication for facts regarding um, X, Y, or Z. You know, and it's you just use the same statements over and over again, and you you try to encourage your community to look to the one reliable source. The really great, if I can just add on uh, everything that Lisa said, it's a really great question, Melina, and I would, if you're taking notes and on the training, I would direct you to Appendix T, which starts on page 97, and on through Appendix U, and then more specifically, Appendix V, uh, as in victory, where there's a section on social media and technology use and some really helpful information, something that your crisis response team can review, and then strategize on how you would, how you'd like to utilize the tool. Thank you, Melina. Mike, you want to jump in? Yeah, thank you guys so much for this. I the 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 I, I'm I was trying to put myself in the position of being the person designated to be the connection with the family and and understand. And I, I'm I haven't looked at the appendix. I imagine that there's some resources about you know words you can use, but I also would imagine that. There are some families who just don't want to talk to anyone. Just, you know, leave me alone. 
call me later. Uh, I can't, I can't talk right now. Like, you know, uh, there are some families maybe who just don't want to say, who just need to grieve and, and be left alone. Is, is that often the case? And is there anything as the, as the person who's in charge of contacting the family you can do to just respect that? Um, that that's kind of where my, where, that's my, my question. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it is. It is a reaction that that families do share, and and in those circumstances, um, the the school side and or the district will still need to send out some communication indicating there has been a death of a student within our community, and we are sharing this with you to provide you with resources to um, be able to talk to your children about you know, death or whatnot, and you leave it a little bit more opaque, the communication, so that you don't bring any more attention to that particular family. And you're really trying to respect that they wanna be anonymous and they want to process this in their own way. Um, having a student die um, during the school year, well, also any time of the year, you have to get facts out to the staff and the students and the community, not about the particular individual or that family, but acknowledging that a trauma occurred. Um, because if we don't acknowledge it, then we're not equipping our community to cope with it and move through it in a unified way. Um, there are letters in here. There's great examples of parents don't want any sort of, they want to remain anonymous. They don't want anybody being, notified of who they are, who their student was. But again, we have to um, acknowledge it as an overall community um, because it is a tragedy and, and the students and the families and the staff are going to need that information to help them begin to cope. Yeah, just one, one comment, and Mike, I'm so glad you asked that question. Just for those of you taking notes, uh, to Lisa's comment, see Appendix C, um, page 57, where there's a sample letter, should the family request that the cause of death not be disclosed, that's a tool there for you. Great. Thank you so much. All right. Any other hands? Lisa, do you see anyone with a hand in the air? All right. So in closing, three things. We have three asks. If you're taking notes, maybe scribble these down for us. We want you to become familiar with the protocols. We don't want you to become an expert. Um, if you become an expert, it's, it's often through practice. So in that way, we want you to be really bad at these protocols. But we do encourage you to get familiar with the protocols and get familiar with the language. Get familiar with the function and roles of your crisis response team. And, you know, we really see ourselves as an extension to, uh, of your districts and your sites. And so let us know if you need our help and our support. That's number two. Um, protocols require notification, but if you need help, I want you to let us know, please. The invitation is open. And lastly, uh, just a big thank you. These protocols exist and are the way they are because of you. So let us know if something is missing, if something needs to be enhanced. As Lisa mentioned earlier, our resources page will have the most current version of the document. So if you notice anything that doesn't look right or you have a question, please let us know so we can incorporate that fix. And uh, we always love to hear from you with, with questions. And with that, um, a big thank you. And I'll turn it over to Lisa, back to Lisa for final comments. Yeah, thank you for partnering with us today. Um, we just want to reiterate, we view this as, as being part of the broader community. We from MCOE will show up at your district, at your school site, whatever is needed to work shoulder to shoulder with you through any tragedy or crisis. Uh, creating a manual was not meant at all to indicate, here you go, you're on your own. Um, instead, it's meant to actually bring us closer together um, so that we can support one another. So hoping you never have to use it, but if you do, that you feel equipped in a way to begin to navigate. 
So we really appreciate you and all you do every day. Thank you. Have a good afternoon and good evening. Goodbye.